Lennon said, I get by with a little help from my friends. And in this case, that would be you, all of you. We're able to have a presenter each week only because of your willingness to share your wisdom, experience, and talents with the rest of us. It's amazing what you know, how diverse we are. We can do this every week and not repeat ourselves in a very small community. So I ask you please not to be shy or think that your offering might be too trivial. We'll decide that. <laughs> Let us hear from you or perhaps you can re recommend somebody who you think would be a great presenter. We are currently programmed through August 7th. August 14th and 21 are open, as are September 4th and 25th. You can contact me or David Bryan over there by the sound equipment through our website, opencircleahiki.org, where you can indicate your desire to be a presenter. Or you can see me after today's presentation. <clears throat> I'll be lingering by the sound desk hoping to catch a few fish. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, next week's presenter will be, uh, the title of the presentation will be Father Hunting and presented by John Thomas Dodd. And, and it'll also be Father's Day next week. Um, and so Father Hunting is a personal journey and poetic narrative exploring abandonment, separation, and fatherhood. It chronicles the child in search of a father, becoming a father himself, overcoming child custody, and then letting go, coming full circle in a loving father-son relationship. Please plan on joining us next week for Father's Day. It should be a very, very good presentation. Uh, Oh, <laughs> you think so? <laughs> okay. Wow. I'm sorry, yes? Wow. Yes, I'm going to do that now. <laughs> We're just so anxious. <laughs> Would you like to pass the basket? <laughs> oh, we got that. That's what we're going to do now. We're going to pass a basket, and we ask for donations. We have various expenses of Open Circle, including the rent that we pay here to uh, Lake Chapala Society, and for the technical assistance, and the men and women who prepare our food and wash our cars and set the chairs and set them down and basically take care of us. And while that's happening, I've got a couple of jokes to tell. They say humor is good for you. Okay, here's one. Working people frequently ask retired people what they do to make their days interesting. Now, that doesn't include us, but in the rest of the world. Well, for my wife and I, for example, the other day we went into town and went into a shop. We were only in there for about five minutes. When we came out, there was a cop waiting, writing out a parking ticket. We went up to him and said, come on, man, how about giving a senior citizen a break? He ignored us and continued writing the ticket. I called him a Nazi nerd. He glared at me and started writing another ticket for the worn, worn tires. So my wife called him a shithead. He finished the second ticket and put it on the windshield with the first. Then he started writing the third ticket. This went on for about 20 minutes. The more we abused him, the more tickets he wrote. Personally, we didn't care. We came into town by bus. And this car had a back plate. <laughs> we, we try to have a little fun each day now that we're retired. It's important for us. <laughs> Give you any ideas? <laughs> uh, this next one is a good, better, best um, speeding in Idaho collection. A Boise, Idaho policeman had a perfect spot to watch for speeders, but he wasn't getting many. Then he discovered the problem. A 12-year-old boy was standing up the road with a hand-painted sign, which read, Radar Trap Ahead. The officer also found the boy had an accomplice who was down the road with a sign reading, Tips, 
<laughs> and a bucket full of money. And we, yes, we used to just sell lemonade. If anyone could get me a glass of water, I'd appreciate it. My mouth is really dry. Um, the better one is a motorist was mailed a picture of his car speeding through an automated radar post in Moscow, Idaho. A $40 speeding ticket was included. Being cute, he sent the police department a picture of $40. The police responded with another mailed photo of handcuffs. <laughs> Best. A young woman was pulled over for speeding. An Idaho state trooper walked to her car window, flipping open his ticket book. She said, I bet you are going to sell me a ticket to the state trooper's ball. He replied, Idaho state troopers don't have balls. <laughs> there was a moment of silence. He then closed his book, got back in his patrol car, and left. <laughs> Excuse me just a minute. Okay, and in honor today, we're, we're done with the collections, right? Yes. Okay, in, in honor today of our speaker, a very short one. What do you call a vegetarian who goes back to eating meat? Someone who lost their virginity. <laughs> well, let's see, I have, I have a place to put this, but at this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker. <laughs> It's hard to do with one hand here. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Meditation. <coughs> I need two hands to speak. <laughs> Use a cup holder. <laughs> oh, a cup holder. How very brilliant. And I'm going to put this microphone down. And now I have two hands. And I can say that today's meditation will be led by Barbara Hilt.
So as we come back and we allow our thinking selves, our minds, to start preparing to listen to our speaker and to take away knowledge and wisdom and to go out into the world, may we always remember that we can find peace, we can be peace, and we can share our peace with others. Okay, so now I would like to introduce today's presenter. His name is Greg Laviolette, and his talk will focus on three compelling reasons why people should adopt a plant-based diet. He will also share his personal experience of transitioning from KFC and Burger King to a fully plant-based diet. Greg Laviolette is a plant-based chef from Sarnia, Ontario, where he kick-started his career as a food activist in 2010. Realizing that Facebook posts won't change the world, he organized Sarnia Grows, a documentary film festival focusing on urban agriculture. Later that year, he started a weekend pop-up restaurant, which he successfully ran for 14 months before opening Green's Organic Cafe and Market, a full-time cafe that consistently garnered five stars from TripAdvisor. Greg sold the cafe in December of 2014 and returned to Mexico where he and his partner had built an off-grid... I am sorry, Greg, I don't have the rest of it. <laughs> so, I'm going to leave it to you to fill us in on what you did when you built an off-grid something. <laughs>
So I set out to learn. Oh, and now I make vegan bacon grease and cheese. So I enrolled at the University of Google and immersed myself in the strange and exciting new world and very early on discovered a couple things that I had never really considered when I thought about food. Nutrition and growing food. I had never really given any thought to nutrition. Food was about taste, pretentious menu descriptions, and artful presentation. So while I was retra retraining myself how to cook with new ingredients, flavorings, and textures, I was also discovering how these foods were affecting my health, and I planted my first garden. Now the house where we were living in was a rental, so I planted a container garden in the driveway, which was the only spot on the property, property which got sufficient sun. I planted about 150 containers, and it did really well. I did the same the following summer, but we bought a house and moved in August. We took the vegetable garden with us. So while all of these changes were taking place, I was also working in a restaurant that served all the food which I now knew to be so detrimental on so many levels. But I was stuck, mainly because this restaurant belonged to my family. So this restaurant was a total junk food restaurant. It was more than junk food. It was what junk food aspired to be. <laughs> everything there, absolutely everything, was fried in lard. And it still is. And they're very popular. So when I negotiated this job with my mother on my return from Mexico, I committed to five years. It was a very rough five years indeed. And quite often I would become very upset at work because I felt like a huge hypocrite. I wanted to shout out all of this new information from the rooftops, but I was trapped flipping burgers and making popcorn chicken. Now, when I started working for my family, I had a real weakness for this kind of food, and I ate a lot of it. Poutine, for you Canadians, being my favorite. But it was only two months after I started working for them that I had my great epiphany. So I endured the full five years being torn between family obligation and personal integrity. As the end of my tenure was approaching the end of my five years, I started to plan my next move. Restaurants were all I knew. And it didn't matter in which restaurant I worked, I would always be dealing with meat, dairy, fish, and eggs. We couldn't move to a bigger city with vegan restaurants where I could work because we had bought and were renovating a house. So I had to basically create my own opportunity in this small town. So now, as I required all of this, as I acquired all of this new information over the five years previous to me leaving my family's restaurant, I of course shared it all via Facebook and annoyingly. <laughs> but Facebook just didn't seem that effective to me. I had to do something more. At the end of 2010, as a kind of New Year's resolution, I decided that I had to graduate from Facebook activism to actual activism. So that's what I did. I, with a friend, organized a weekend documentary film festival in our town, focusing on urban farming and food justice. We showed three full-length documentaries and a dozen shorts. It was also the first time that I spoke publicly and I bombed. I was horrible. But, and there were like 20 people in the audience. It wasn't a big crowd. Um, but regardless, the weekend proceeded and gave me a kind of confidence to do more. So that was in 2011, and that same year I opened up a pop-up cafe which is an independent cafe which operates out of an existing cafe during their off hours. And it's a great way for young people to get into the business. Not that I'm young anymore. So Eddie and I rented the small ca a small cafe on the weekend that belonged to a couple of friends and went in with all of our own food and presented a completely vegan menu. We were fairly busy right from the start and I was able to make a living from it. Uh, we did this for 14 months, along with giving weekly cooking classes, and when the cafe that we were working out of closed, because the couple that ran it split up, we, along with a couple of silent partners, a plant-based doctor and her husband, with whom I had spoken to earlier about going into business with, because the writing was on the wall, this cafe would not survive the breakup, and I wasn't going down to the ship. So we all went into business together. We secured the lease, bought all of the equipment, orchestrated a two-week restaurant makeover, and opened as a full-time vegan cafe. 
Now, people thought we were insane. Because the town where all of this happened is not large or progressive. It's a conservative working class city of 70,000 people. But we took a chance and thought that there was enough interest to sustain us through, through the week. There was more than enough. The cafe was a hit. And within the first year, we had moved to the second highest rated restaurant in town, according to the new gold standard TripAdvisor, and maintained that position and five-star rating until we sold the cafe at the end of 2014 to move back to Mexico. So who would have thought that a vegan cafe would be so popular in a small blue-collar city? I have to say that 90% of our clientele were not plant-based or vegan. They came to the cafe for healthy food, and we love that because for so many of them, this was their introduction to plant-based cuisine. And by showing people how good the food can be, we were opening them up to the possibility of changing their diet. So it turned out that people were literally starving for this kind of food. And not only the food, but they wanted knowledge as well. So we did all sorts of outreach in addition to running the cafe. We continued on with cooking classes and showed documentaries, organized potlucks and meetups. We had a small library of plant-based health and cookbooks, as well as some books dealing with animal ethics. We had a mission statement that was predominantly displayed on the wall, which explained the three reasons that people either adopt a plant-based diet or become vegan. We were also the only restaurant in the city that composted all of our waste. We also had a small market where we sold organic produce and what we called vegan essentials like nutritional yeast and raw cashews. We also encouraged backyard farmers to bring in their produce to sell. The cafe is still doing great. The woman who bought it emails me occasionally and asks me, how did you do this? Because it was so much work. And the work is why I will never open another. <laughs> so, so no need to ask me about that in the Q&A. <laughs> so what are the three reasons someone chooses to adopt a plant-based diet or become vegan? So before I go any further, I should define those two terms, plant-based and vegan. Because although they share some similarities, there are enough differences to warrant an explanation. So the term plant-based diet was popularized by the 2011 documentary Forks Over Knives, which I'm sure much of, many of you have seen, and by a group of doctors who have been promoting this diet for decades, like Dr. John McDougall, Dr. Caldwell Ethelson, Dr. Neil Bernard, and Dr. Michael Clapper. There are many more plant-based doctors, but those really are the superstars. Now, a plant-based diet was defined in the documentary as a diet based on vegetables, fruit, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes, with the avoidance of all animal products. It is a very healthy, generally low-fat diet of minimally produced, plant, minimally processed plant foods. All of the doctors that I have mentioned, plus scores more, promote the same diet with small variations, but they all agree that animal products should be avoided. Now, a vegan diet is the diet eaten by a vegan. So one becomes a vegan first, then changes the way they eat, like what happened to me. So what is veganism? So veganism, as I practice it, and as it was defined by the man Donald Wasman, who coined the term in 1944, is the commitment to non-violence as much as is possible in this very violent culture we find ourselves in. So veganism rejects violence against other sentient animals, including humans. It rejects violence against nature, the environment, and it rejects violence against ourselves. A vegan diet isn't by definition a healthy diet, but almost all the vegans that I know do eat healthily, because to eat otherwise would be a form of violence. And we want to show that vegans can be healthy and vibrant, despite the stereotypes. You know the ones that vegans are weak and pale. Those same stereotypes uh, that I used to perpetuate in my anti-vegan days. Now, now, speaking of unsubstantiated stereotypes, about a year ago, someone looked me straight in the eye and without any provocation from me said that she had never met a healthy vegan and walked away. So karma is always waiting. 
So big kids also don't wear leather or fur or wool, and don't attend animal circuits, gender zoos, or aquariums. As much as is possible, vegans choose to not participate in the exploitation of other sentient animals. So there are the differences. Plant-based is a healthy, whole foods, generally low-fat diet, and veganism is an ethical position. Now, now that that's been clarified, because there really is a lot of confusion about those two terms, let's move on and address the three reasons that one adopts a plant-based diet or becomes vegan. So let's start with health. There are literally hundreds of nutrition studies now that conclude that a whole food plant-based diet is exceptionally beneficial for human health. It is the position of the major diet, diet sorry, the major dietetic association, including the Canadian, American, British, and Australian dietetic associations, that a well-planned, purely plant-based diet is appropriate at all stages of life including pregnancy and infancy. A whole foods, plant-based diet is rich in health-promoting phytonutrients, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, and fiber. All of the nutrients that humans need, including ample protein and calcium, are readily available in plants. Vitamin D12 is the exception, and we can discuss that in the, in the Q&A if you like. But what I will say regarding B12 is that it is recommended that everyone over 50 take a vitamin B12 supplement. The science backing the health benefits of a plant-based diet really can't be denied. Generally speaking, because there will always be exceptions, people on a plant-based diet live longer than their omnivorous counterparts, they have less heart disease, less type 2 diabetes, lower cholesterol levels, lower blood pressure, less arthritis, less cancer, and are slimmer. Interestingly, those eating a completely plant-based diet have significantly less toxins in their body as compared to those eating animal products. The reason for this is that industrial pollutants such as dioxins and DDT, which was banned in the 70s but is still persistent in the food chain, concentrate in fat cells as they move up the food chain. Fish, eggs, dairy, and meat, in that order, are the greatest contributors to toxins in the human diet. So, if you want to detox, you really don't have to do a green juice fast for a week or take any of these dubious detox supplements. Just eliminate all animal products from your diet. My favorite detox food, mashed potatoes and gravy. <laughs> so, there are hundreds of elite athletes that follow a plant-based diet for performance. From tennis champions to hockey players to footballers. As a matter of fact, there is a completely plant-based British soccer team. And the world's strongest man, strong man, Patrick Babunian, describes himself as a leader. Now, if you are interested in researching a plant-based diet, please stick to the science-based information. There is so much of the unsubstantiated internet chatter out there that it can be very confusing. I always tell my students that I am not a health expert, but rather a health geek. And after intensively studying nutrition for the last decade, I have learned to defer to the experts in the field of plant-based nutrition. I highly recommend the work of Dr. John McDougall, who, by the way, was able to halt the progress of MS in patients in his latest National Institutes of Health study with a low-fast, plant-based, starch-centered diet, as well as the work of doctors Esselstyn, Clapper, Bernard, Greger, and Campbell. Cut through the chatter and stick with the pros. Now, let's talk about the second reason that one would choose a plant-based diet, the environment. Environmentally speaking, we are in a downward spiral. If you really what's going on in terms of environmental degrada degra degradation and our rapidly changing climate, you should be quite concerned. The easiest way to greatly reduce your personal contribution to this unfolding situation is to give up animal products. Animal agriculture is an environmental disaster. It is the leading contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, water pollution, and habitat loss. 
resulting in species extinction. In 2006, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a United Nations agency, released a study called Livestock's Long Shadow, which claimed that animal agriculture was responsible for 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions, more than the entire transportation sector combined. Then in 2009, two environmental analysts from the World Bank, Jeff Hanhan and Robert Goodman, looked at the data presented in the IPCC report and concluded, because of erroneous data such as underestimating the number of global livestock by more than 30 billion, and the omission of contributing factors such as cattle respiration and grossly underestimating the impact of methane, they concluded that animal agriculture is actually responsible for a staggering 51% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Now, that is more than half of all greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this number may seem unreasonably high, but when we look at some other facts, such as one-third of the ice-free surface of the Earth has been given over to either grazing animals or growing their feed, and every year, more than 70 billion, that's 70 million million animals are slaughtered for human consumption, we can, under, we can start to understand the enormity of the industry and its detrimental effects on our shared environment. Raising these animals for food is also the single greatest drain on fresh water. In the United States, for example, domestic use of water accounts for only 5% of total fresh water consumption, whereas animal agriculture accounts for 55%. So, California's ban on watering lawns should really be a ban on, say, growing alfalfa to feed to livestock. Let me give you a few comparisons. So, one kilo of beef requires more than 15,000 liters of water to produce. One kilo of potatoes, 250. A kilo of chicken, the least water-intensive animal raised for consumption, requires 3,500 liters of water to produce. One kilo of wheat, 900. So Greek yogurt, which seems to be quite popular, and I crunch these numbers myself, requires 2,000 liters of water to produce just one liter. That's four cups of yogurt. So let me put that into a personal perspective. So we live off-grid, and once a week our two tinankos that are on our roof are filled from our neighbor's well. Each tinanko holds 1,100 liters of water. So the two of us use 2,200 liters of water to shower, wash dishes, do laundry, do laundry, water our large vegetable garden, our 60 fruit trees, and everything else that requires water in our house or on the property. Now, we do have a great water system, so we reuse a lot of the water. But it is astounding to me that one week's supply of fresh water for two people is equivalent to one measly liter of Greek yogurt. It almost seems criminal. So now, it makes no difference if it's local, artisan, organic, grass-fed, hay-free, free range Animal products across the board are incredibly water intensive. And water is not a, new, a renewable resource. Agri aquifers all across the planet are being sucked dry to grow grain to feed farmed animals. So what about grain? Animals raised for food eat half of all the grain grown on the planet. Half. And the conversion rate of plants to flesh, or the return on caloric investment, if you like, is shockingly low. It takes seven pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef. But let's put that into a caloric equation. To produce 2,000 calories of beef, the cow must consume 20,000 calories of corn or soy. That is a really, really bad return on investment. Chickens, again, the less resource-intensive animal that we raise for food, has a 50% return on investment. That is, it takes two kilos of vegetable input to get one kilo out. 
Now, you may argue that the animals or animal products you consume are not grain fed, but pastured. But in the United States, 94%, and I'm sure this percentage applies to all of North America, 94% of all animal products come from so-called factory farms. And this system of growing these animals is the only way to meet demand. Now, if we were to outlaw factory farms tomorrow, imagine what would happen to the price of pasture-raised beef, lamb, chicken, eggs, or cheese. The only reason that these products are affordable right now, and the only reason that, they're, uh, that they are even available, is because the, the demand for them is relatively small compared to the demand for cheaper products that are produced on these factory farms. So, in a way, factory farms are subsidizing pasture-raised animal products. They are keeping the price low. Now, I want to quickly touch on the topic of food justice. There are nearly a billion souls on the planet that do not get enough daily calories. And it's not because we don't produce enough. We produce enough calories for 10 billion people. It is because of the very low caloric return on investment that I spoke of earlier. We grow grain to feed to animals and end up with less calories than if we used that grain for direct human consumption. This is incredibly unjust. Before I move on to the last part of my talk, I'd like to leave you with only one more statistic. According to a new paper by four Oxford researchers that was released just a couple of months ago, the dietary carbon footprint of someone eating a completely plant-based diet is 70% less than that of someone eating a typical omnivorous diet. It is crucial that we reduce the amount of carbon and carbon equivalents like methane and nitrous oxide going into the environment. And we need to do it quickly. The easiest way to do this is by simply tweaking your diet. Okay, so that brings me to the last reason someone would choose to stop eating meat, dairy, fish, and eggs. The violence of the matter. We live in an incredibly violent culture. And I'm not only talking about the obvious forms of violence, such as gun violence, or war, or domestic violence, but of the violence and, and exploitation that makes our modern lives possible. When I think of violence, I think of fossil fuel extraction and burning, I think of nuclear waste, I think of the tragic amount of garbage in our depleted and acidifying oceans. I think of deforestation. I think of those billion souls who go to bed hungry every night, and of those 70 billion non-human animals that are slaughtered every year because we like the way that they are their secretion taste. Now, according to Jane philosophy, our very existence will cause harm. But we have a moral obligation to reduce the amount of harm that we personally cause. As I said, modern life is made possible by violence. But this is the world that we have been born into. And it is almost impossible to live a modern life without burning fossil fuel, be it from driving, eating because of agricultural practices, cooking, eating our homes, etc. When we were living in Canada, in Ontario, every time we turned on the lights, we were creating nuclear waste because 60% of Ontario's energy comes from nuclear power. My home is now powered exclusively from the sun, I don't think today, but I know that the panels that I, I have involve rare earth mineral mining and very likely exploitative labor. But I do see it as a reduction of violence, because those panels should last 20 years. Sometimes we have to choose between the lesser of two evils. So, I think you probably get my point. We live in, in violent times, but we can easily reduce the amount of violence that we participate in by simply filling up our plate and belly with vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, grains, and legumes. By making this simple change, and it really is simple. We extract ourselves from so many forms of violence, from global hunger to resource depletion, deforestation, ocean dead zones, habitat loss, and extinction of wild animals. We also stop our participation in the needless suffering and death of 70 billion land animals and a trillion ocean animals annually. 
we greatly reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane that we personally produce. There is no way that we can stop all of our participation in this violence that underpins our modern lives. But going plant-based is the easiest and most pragmatic way to reduce your impact. I'd like to leave you with one final thought. In a world that we find ourselves living in, in a world of 7.4 billion inhabitants, a rapidly changing climate, crippling inequality, so much poverty and so much violence, we have the means to make a huge difference. And we can start today. It doesn't cost anything. You have nothing to lose, but everything to gain. And the benefits don't stop with you. There is a ripple effect. Everyone benefits. So I hope that I make my case. I could go on for hours, but I've, I've attempted to get the big picture across to you in 30 minutes or less. I've also tried not to get too heavy, but these are serious issues, and they need to be discussed in a serious manner. We all have a choice. We can continue to literally, literally eat the future, or we can make some minor changes to our diet. Truly, if the anti-vegan can do it, and make a career out of it, <laughs> so can you. So thanks, and I'll try to answer any questions. Sort of all my life. 
price. But there were a lot of other things, too, that were just, um, I always thought, oh, yeah, protein, yeah, oh, yeah, meat, oh, chicken, oh, peach, whatever. Whoa, things have changed. And in about three days, it's become, I'm going to be a vegan, too. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, the, the time of study is the largest nutritional study ever undertaken. And Colin Campbell, who you can even find online, you can listen to online lectures. So you don't actually have to read the book. He, the book is very interesting, but he covers a lot of these topics uh, in in lectures. So you can just sort of watch that online. Um, milk is milk and dairy products are really detrimental to human health, and the only reason that people think that they're healthy is because the milk industry has led us to believe. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, which is led by Dr. Neil Barnard, um, sued. Um, the American milk producers, I don't exactly know what they're called, because they came up with this slogan that said, milk does the body good, and there was, there was no proof. So he sued them, and they had to stop using, using that slogan. Yeah, I was wondering if in your research, uh, did you come across anything that says that uh, veganism isn't for absolutely everyone, that uh, uh, meat products do actually do people good. And the only reason I'm asking is because I was a vegan for um, probably five years before I went back to eating meat, and that was the only thing that cured my uh, autoimmune diseases. Right. I, no. I think that, and I hear this about people, I don't think there's anything miraculous in meat. There's no there's some protein or some fat or vitamin K. Um, I hear a lot of, not a lot, but I hear about people who were vegan and then are plant-based and then went back to eating meat because of health. But I think, like the Dalai Lama, <laughs> but I think if you went to a plant-based doctor, the doctor would give you different, different advice. I think there's always a way. I think, it, it, but it depends again on your motivation. If it's all about health, then, then you'll go, you know, you'll eat some, some animal products. If it's about non-violence, you'll find a way to make it work. So. My question is about uh, when one purchases fresh organic kale or Swiss chard and you wash it and freeze it, how much nutrition is lost by freezing? I don't think any nutrition is lost by freezing. No. Or if, if there is, it's very little. Yeah. No, frozen vegetables, if you can't get fresh vegetables, buy frozen. That's the, and then, and then can. But frozen is the second best after fresh. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I've been on a plant-based diet for seven years. I read the China study and I changed my diet and every year I feel better and better. Um, can you please explain a little bit of the misinformation regarding the Atkins diet and how people believe that carbs make you fat? And because the more carbs I eat, I seem to lose weight. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, it's crazy that this is uh -huh, that yeah. people avoid the bread. They you know mm -hmm. load up on butter and yeah. how we've been misinformed basically. Well, Atkins was a, is a disaster. <laughs> Truly, I mean it's, it's just this high protein diet and we. we we're already getting far too much protein in our diets. Too much protein is a bad thing. It, it, it sends your body to inflammation. Um, the people lost weight on Atkins because their bodies were going into ketosis. And what happens in ketosis is that's what happens when you're you're terminally ill and you're about to die. Your body goes into ketosis. So that's what the, the diet was doing. It was putting people into the state. Everybody that I knew that, that did the Atkins diet came over with Atkins. Diets just don't work. You have to change your, your whole lifestyle. You have to change the way that you eat. Um, so the, the, the whole myth about carbs. Dr. John McDougall um, calls himself a, a starchivore. And so his diet is all based it, on starches, on pasta, beans. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pasta, beans, rice, potatoes, white potatoes, sweet potatoes. Um, corn. So these are the, the starches that he likes. He sent us this whole, it's, it's a no fat diet, there's no oil in it, um, there's no processed food. I eat a little bit of oil. Um, so he, 
His whole diet is based around starches. And he's taking people with type 2 diabetes, people who should be avoiding these starches, and reversing their condition on these diets. So, yeah, it, starches don't make you fat. Especially if, if, if you don't um, consume any other fat. If you want to have a completely starch-based diet with no additional fats like oils or avocados, then you can reduce weight. Can you please address the benefits of eating quinoa? Well, quinoa, you know, quinoa is, is another grain, and I don't find that, I don't think that quinoa is any better than a lot of other grains than millet or than, even than brown rice, or, but it's good. It's got a nice um, amino acid profile, so it's, it's got a, a complete protein. I want to talk about protein just for a second, because all plants have protein. If bananas have protein. Every single plant has protein, and all that protein is are amino acids, and uh, they're chains of amino acids, and every plant has these amino acids. They're the same amino acids that you would find in, in animal products, and you don't need to combine your, your food. Your body does that for you. As long as you're getting enough calories, you're getting enough protein. Protein deficiency is not a problem. It's, it's never been a problem with a plant-based diet. How do you feel about insects as the wave of the future providing protein? We heard about that in various sources, and they don't—they aren't a crop because they can be nurtured on, on waste, actually. What are we talking? Oh, insects. Insects. Okay. Uh, I'm okay with bees. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't see the need to, to, I mean, if we get to that point, I, I think maybe in, environmentally when we can't, you know, we can't grow these crops anymore, then I think people will be eating insects. You know, no, people, no, people all over the world are eating insects, and they're trying, they're, I think in Mexico they're making cricket flour. They're making flour out of this, making, mixing it with their tortillas. But I, I don't understand when we live in a country that produces beans.
last minute they tear now. Um, please make sure you pick up your coffee cups. The chairs. Turn your cell phones back on. And